So we started a series last week in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be preaching through Luke a lot this year. Um, pretty much the default of where we're going to be is Luke, the Gospel of Luke. There will be some small series where we'll step out of Luke. So through Lent, we'll be going through Exodus, I think. And uh, through Advent, we'll do another series. But for the most part, we're going to stay in the Gospel of Luke this year. And we're just going to go all the way through as far as we possibly can make it before the year ends. It's a, it's a fascinating Gospel. I hope you will... I mean, all the Gospels are fascinating. I love John, which we kind of went over the last couple years. This year, we're going up through Luke. And I hope you'll see some things that, that, that we see differently in Luke than the other Gospels. And um, it's really pretty neat to do that. And I encourage you to, as you're reading through your Bibles, if you're seeing that there's other passages that other gospel writers are writing about, to, to read them and, and to look at them side by side and, and just to travel with us as we go through this gospel. And in these first few chapters, the gospel of Luke really does a good job of, of really letting us know what the mission of God is in the world. So the same writer who wrote Luke, Luke, also wrote Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and a lot of scholars think that those two went together, that they were probably separate scrolls, but they were written in, in, with the intention that they would stay together, that somebody would read through Luke, and then after reading through Luke, they would read right through uh, the Acts of the Apostles. And the neat thing you see in the, the early chapters of Luke, really all throughout Luke and into Acts, is that God is working in the world to do an amazing thing through his Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then into Acts, where God is still working through the world, into the world um, through his church, now empowered by the Spirit. And that there's this kind of parallel uh, work that God is doing, and it's, his intention is that he reaches the world with the good news. That it's no longer confined to just one people. It's, it now reaches all the world, irrespective of race or class or, or social status. And that is an amazing thing. Because it changes the world. And I hope you really will see that as we go through this series. Because um, I think it, it has a lot of bearing in our lives here and now. Uh, in this particular country. But in the world for those around us. So um, if you will pray with me. We're going to jump right into today's text. Lord we, we thank you. We thank you for your word given to us to guide us. We thank you for uh, the things we see as we look through uh, all the Gospels, but especially as we start going through the Gospel of Luke. As we saw last week, uh, John the Baptist, who prepared the way for you and, and your baptism and, and you coming up out of the waters and, and, and heaven being opened and the Spirit descending on you like a dove, Lord. And this week we see as you are led out into the wilderness. Open our hearts and our minds to this text, what it means for the world and what it means for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wanted steak. Seasoned with a little bit of salt and pepper. Sizzling on the plate. A perfect, like, medium rare. Pink in the middle. Okay. Maybe a baked potato on the side and a big glass of sweet iced tea. Although I would have just taken the steak. I wanted steak, but instead, I was sitting there on a rock in a forsaken desert wilderness of Southern California with a knife, peeling a cactus, hoping that it would at least taste edible. Long story short, it didn't. I was in SEER school in the Marine Corps, which means Survival, evasion, resistance, escape. It's a, it's a type of training that, that prepares you if you're ever shot down behind enemy lines. It, it, it prepares you to live off the land, to evade being captured, to resist once you're captured and being interrogated, and to hopefully survive that um, incarceration in a POW camp. And it was, it was great training uh, looking back on it afterwards. During the course of the time, it wasn't. I'd just come out of land survival in, in Florida, where we were able to, where they taught us to live off the land, where we had to catch animals and cook them over the fire, and, and that was a great training. And we went to California for this, this other type of training. And it was just like what we just came from, except we couldn't build fires. 
because we were, we were preparing to be behind enemy lines and a fire would give off smoke. And so you couldn't build fire. So you had to survive eating the things that you could eat without fire. Nuts and berries, certain types of grass, insects, cactus. There weren't any fruits or nuts around. And, and I'd eaten so much grass and so many ants that I felt like I was an ant farm. And, and I was doing the math, and it seemed like I was burning more calories getting grass and ants than I was actually like putting into my body. Now, there was a Navy SEAL guy that was in the training with us, too, and he had found a lizard, and he would eaten it raw. And I thought, man, that, that might be a good idea, until he said, I, I think I can feel it trying to crawl back up. But man, I was, I was tempted. I was tempted to hunt down a lizard to eat. So I settled down for peeling and eating the cactus. Could barely just, barely choke it down. And after many splinters and, or thorns. And, but at least I could survive. It wasn't 40 days. It was just two measly weeks. And I was starving. I was so hungry. If somebody would have plopped a steak down in the middle of our group, we would have fought to the death to get that food. Our instructors, this is just how ornery people can be. Our instructors, who were just over the ridge, had built a big fire, and they would roast all kinds of delicious smelling food over the fire every night as we sat outside in the dark and the cold, just hoping for food. And we would sit and plan. We're like, hey, when they go to sleep, let's break into their camp, steal all their food, tie them up and just head for the mountains like that's how desperate we were for food that's how tempted people who never thought that they would steal anything were were making elaborate plans to steal stuff that was the temptation that's how strong it was and how real it was so today i want to talk about temptation it makes sense right we just read a passage where jesus is tempted if you're a human being you will face temptation Interestingly enough, one of the ways that the New Testament writers show us the humanity of Jesus, of Emmanuel, God with us, is how he identifies with humanity in the temptation. Temptation is a human experience. There, there will be people who make it through life without suffering. There will be people who make it through life, believe it or not, without really too much sorrow. Some people will make it through life without ever experiencing violence or racism or classism. People will make it through life without that. But every single person will experience temptation. Temptation comes to all of us. So it's a question of when, not if. How many of you guys feel what I'm saying? Like, you know that feeling. The, the temptation to eat that second helping even though you just let out your belt a notch the previous week. The, the temptation to flip that person off in traffic who just ran the red light and almost creamed into you. The, the temptation to give a snarky comment to your significant other because you're irritated to them. The temptation to take that second or that third look at that very attractive person that just walked by. The, the temptation to go to that website late at night that you know you shouldn't go to. The temptation to spend money that you don't have. The temptation to, to, to lie just to make life a little easier. The temptation to hit those slots just one more time. Or have that extra drink or neglect that responsibility or cheat on that test. I could go on and on and on because there's as many as people there are in the world, there's temptations. But you get my point. All of us will face temptation. Today's text is about temptation. Jesus was baptized. And then he was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness where he faced three temptations from Satan. There are four observations I want to make about that and one point to draw it all to a close at the end. So if you're taking notes, I guess you can make that there's, there's five points to the sermon although the first two are similar so I'm probably going to clump them together and then the last one's not really a point it's just a conclusion but we'll go with that point one 
and point two. So point one is that I've already talked about. We are going to face temptation in life. Point two is that just because we are Christians and have the Holy Spirit living within us doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden given some magical force field that protects us from all temptation. A lot of people think that's what it means. I mean, I talk to Christians all the time who struggle with doubt because they are being tempted to sin. And because they face temptation and often fall, it creates doubt. Even non-Christians struggle with this. I used to work for a man who I consider a, a good friend who loved to point out when Christians did dumb things. He would say stuff like, aren't Christians not supposed to do things like that? In one sense, he would be right. Christians aren't supposed to do dumb things that you know, bring the bad media into place. But it's not a guarantee. And his assumption was, even though he's not a believer, that Christians were supposed to be somehow immune from all that. But it isn't a guarantee. Listen, if the Son of God faced temptation to sin, then who are we to think that we're not going to? We're going to face them as well. When we become a Christian, we don't suddenly step into a bubble of protection that shields us from temptation. Luke tells us that Jesus is led into the wilderness where Satan tempts him. The same account in Matthew actually tells us that Jesus was led out into the wilderness in order to be tempted or tested. Christians believe that when we become a Christian, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit isn't something that keeps us from all problems in this world. It's something that can empower us to fight temptation. If you are a Christian, you may not feel it. At times, you may even doubt it. But if you have rested in Christ for salvation, then you have received the Holy Spirit, and he works in you. That is a truth, and that's a promise that we see in God's Word. I really wish it meant that you got this holy hamster ball that surrounded you that would protect you as you walked around and shield you from trials and temptations, but it doesn't. We still have to face, and we still have to fight them. In fact, we grow as we face and as we fight them. If you don't expect to face temptations, you're going to lose the battle before it even starts. You'll be walking along, and then all of a sudden, bam, and you'll fall. If you talk to an elite athlete or read an interview with an elite athlete before a big game, the, what's the, one of the major things that they're focusing on? getting their mind into the game, preparing themselves mentally for the battle that's about to take place on the field or court. They are preparing themselves so that they're ready for whatever the other team brings against them. The same goes with temptation. If you haven't prepared yourself mentally, you will fail. I've talked with alcoholics who have been sober for years and they will say the key to being sober for years is they almost always keep their guard up. They're always, almost always keeping a conscious effort to keep on the forefront of their mind that they can fall into that. For them, there's no one drink after work with their coworkers because that one drink is never one drink. And they know that and they, they work to, to keep themselves insulated against that. One of the biggest temptations that I hear about in believers nowadays is porn. One stat that I read this week from Covenant Eyes, which is a, 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 an internet company that develops software to protect computers against that kind of stuff, is this. And this, is, this blew my mind. 63% of 18 to 30-year-olds watch porn multiple times a week. And 79% of 18 to 30-year-olds view porn at least once a month. And this despite all the data that tells us just how destructive it can be. Porn use is cited in 56% of divorces as a reason for the divorce. It leads to increased depression, anxiety, isolation. Those are all provable studies. 
That's a lot of people falling into temptation. Tim Regal, who leads a nonprofit that helps men and women battle against porn use, lists different ways to help fight that temptation. And most of them revolve around knowing that there is a battle that they are fighting. That, that just being aware and taking precautions to keep from falling into it. To fight day after day. Fight the battle day after day. There's a reason why Paul in the New Testament uses battle imagery when he talks about this. In Ephesians 6, he writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when that evil comes, you can fight against it. You can stand. We put on the full armor of God because it's warfare. And we have to know that. C.S. Lewis writes this about temptation. He says, no man or woman knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people... Do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They've lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is the only man who knows to the full what temptation means if we don't expect it we can't prepare for it if we don't know that it will be hard then we won't be prepared to fight it Jesus is in the wilderness and he faces temptation the way he is prepared that we see in this text is that he sunk God's word deep into his heart. The truth of God's word is there. His response to Satan isn't some long philosophical argument on a number of points that can be read into each temptation. It's just scripture. Make this stone into bread. Man does not live on bread alone. Boom. Bow to me and I'll give you what you want. Worship God only. Throw yourself off of this great height. God will protect you. Do not test your God. Boom. And we'll talk a little bit about those temptations here in a little bit. The third observation is this. We see the true nature of temptation in this passage. And the true nature is this. Temptation is a lie that promises something it can never deliver. It may build upon elements of the truth, but it is not the true and, truth and can never be true. Satan couch, couches two of the temptations in this passage by sowing doubt or tr- attempting to sow doubt in Jesus' mind with a lie. He implies that Jesus isn't the Son of God. It isn't that Satan doubts that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he's, he's asking Jesus to prove himself. Satan knows who he is. Satan is trying to insert doubt into Jesus' mind. If you are the Son of God, comes immediately after Jesus is baptized, and God spoke from heaven, telling him that he was his Son. So Satan is directly countering God's word. Or attempting to do that, to to sow doubt into that. 
Satan sows doubt and lies in the heart of humankind. That's how Adam and Eve fell. They were tempted by something they were not supposed to do. And it was couched in doubt of God's word, his truthfulness. And they failed. In the Garden of Eden, Satan introduced doubt that fed into their curiosity and their desire. Did God really say that you are not to eat of the fruit? In the middle of the tree, in the middle of the garden? And Eve answers, yes, he, he said that. He said, do not eat of the fruit. Do not even touch it or you will, you will die. And Satan comes back with, you'll not surely die. Do you see that? Working that doubt in. Another question, doubt planted in their minds. How much of our temptations grow from that kind of doubt? I mean, if I do this once, it's not going to do. It's not going to matter much, right? Just giving this once, this one time, it won't hurt. Satan works that way. He introduces doubt. That's how he works in this passage. He does it twice in verses three and nine. If you are the Son of God, if. The temptation is to give in to doubt about God's provision and care. You see, the first temptation is about trusting God to provide the things Jesus needs. He has fasted. He is hungry, we are told. Luke tells us that. He's hungry. The most vibrant and carnal of needs for Jesus in that moment is food. I am sure his stomach hurt. I'm sure his, it was growling. I don't, I'm sure it was clenched up. With hunger pains. Feed. But his response to Satan is that ultimately he will trust in God to bring him what he needs. The response that Jesus gives is a reference from Deuteronomy 8.3. And it looks back to a time when God's people were in the wilderness. God was supplying their every need. I, I encourage you to read Deuteronomy 8. God was supplying their every need, food, water, clothing, in order to teach them that they, they could trust in him. They could rely upon him to give them the things that he needed, that, that they needed, that they could trust in God and his word and his promises. And of course, they grumbled and were unhappy. They wanted more. But Jesus, unlike God's people, is content to wait and trust for God to provide. Certainly he could have turned stones to bread, but he trusted. In verse 9, just before the third temptation, Satan uses the same strategy to, to introduce doubt yet again, but this time in the context of protection against harm. Jesus again quotes Deuteronomy, this time from 6.16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Once again, referring back to God's people's failure to trust God to do what was best. But Jesus refuses to attempt at manipulation. He refuses to attempt to manipulate God into doing something that he was being pressured into doing. He trusts God completely, rejecting Satan's attempts to create doubt. And then the second temptation, the one we see in verses 5 through 8, that's just a lie. It appears to have some level of truth to it, but it isn't ultimately truthful. Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and tells him that he will give Jesus authority and power in these kingdoms, which he may be able to do in one sense. Several passages in the Bible seem to point to the idea that Satan does have a type of power to work in and through systems and institutions in this world. But he leaves out one little detail. He has no authority, no power, apart from what God gives him in the first place. But Jesus doesn't delve into that, really. His response is simple. The, the only one who deserves worship is God. Deuteronomy 6.13. Fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan lies 
He promises things he can never deliver. That's what temptations do. They promise to deliver something that in our minds we want. And we convince ourselves will give us what we want. In the course of ministry over the years, Evie and I have ministered to several couples where one spouse has cheated on the other. Every case, without an exception, every case where one spouse cheated on the other, the affair promised something that they were looking for. It promised it. It never delivered it. In every case, that promise was a lie. A lie that at first seemed to give the thing it promised, but quickly fell away into pain and hurt and sorrow. It's a lie. The fourth point is this. When we are faced with temptation, we will either successfully fight it or fall to it. And so what we do in the aftermath is really important. Jesus successfully fought it. But we see this interesting statement in verse 13. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Satan didn't say, oh, I'm not going to get this guy. I'm going to give up and and just walk off. He doesn't give up. He, He just bides his time waiting. Slithers around. Yeah, Mickey, slithers. God's word tells us that Satan is a roaring lion prowling around looking for someone to devour and that we need to be alert. Odds are that we will fail at some point. Even if we successfully resist a hundred times, there's going to be a point where we might fail, where we let our guards down, where we're not as alert as we could be, and something hits us in that weak moment Maybe it's a lie that there's no reason you tell it. Maybe it's a, you know, a second glance. or Whatever it is, it, it hits you in that, that, that moment of weakness. And we're going to fall into temptation. What, is it, what do we do with that? Do we just give up? No. Do we let it crush us into the ground? And that brings me to my last point, and I think the most important one. If you don't hear any other points today, this is it. Adam and Eve failed to withstand the doubts that Satan introduced into their minds in the Garden of Eden. Jesus successfully withstood them. The people of God, Israel, failed God in the wilderness. Jesus was faithful to God in his wilderness ordeal. And because of that, we don't have to be crushed by the weight of our failures when we do fail. It actually keeps us from getting too high when we succeed, too. And I'll talk about that in a second. It actually allows us to see our, ourselves and our response to temptation in a way that brings it out into the light, into the open, where we can try to figure it out and work through it so that we don't fall again. In this text, we see something unique about Jesus. He faces these temptations with supreme trust in his Father. And just as he passes these temptations at the beginning of his earthly ministry, he passes them again at the end as well. You see, Jesus, or I'm sorry, you see, Satan left Jesus until an opportune time, we're told in verse 13. In Luke 22, we see that time comes. We see Satan reappear to orchestrate the events that leads to Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus knows the death that he's facing. He knows what awaits him and what is coming. And right before that time comes, just before his arrest, Jesus comes to God in prayer. Luke twenty two thirty nine and following tells us this. Jesus went out as usual. So this was a 
thing he did all the time, as usual to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing to take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus bows to his Father, to his Father's will in perfect obedience. He puts aside the protection that he could have called upon because he knows that in obedience he will accomplish so much. He takes the cup, the cup that his Father has prepared for him, the, the cup of God's judgment for all that is wrong in this world. All the injustice, all the wrongdoing, all the failures to resist sin. All of it. Hebrews 2 tells us this. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, talking about Jesus. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it's not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Because Jesus has served as our high priest. He has made atonement for our sins. When we fail, when we fall, we can receive mercy. We don't have to drink the cup of judgment. Because of him, we find grace to help us in our time of need. If you're a skeptic, if you're, if you're sitting on the fence and maybe you're exploring and you're thinking, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> I, I don't know how true it is. I really encourage you just to try him. Give him a try. Ask him to show you what that means. Explore it. If you already trust him for your salvation, live in it. Don't get too high on your successes. He was the only one that was 100%. Don't get too low on your failures. It isn't an exam where you have to pass with a certain percentage point. You've already passed because Jesus took the exam for you. Rest in that. Now you can really explore. You can really find out the, the things that, that, that get you when you do fall into temptations. You don't have to be afraid of them. You can, you can calm out in tr into truth. You can, you can tell an accountability partner and work through the things that, that cause those problems, those issues in your life. Trust him. And you'll see growth. Pray with me. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to fight temptation when it comes. Help us to be prepared for it when it comes. But when we're not, Lord, help us to remember your grace and your mercy. Help us to remember what you've done for us. Sink it deep into our hearts. That it would shape us and grow us. And Lord, just protect us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.